Grand Rising, my friends. Happy to have you back. Hope everyone's in a great mind place. If you're not, we got to get you there. That's as I tell you, it's all about positive thinking and, and, and will. You will yourself to where you want to be in this world. Most people don't understand that. It's about the power of intention. Um, that's, that's probably one of the things you'll understand most about me is that I'm always trying to look for where the good exists. Not necessarily good, but also where the fairness exists where we, we should strive to be better than we expect of ourselves, even for other people. And, and we work with them to make them better. Um, but we're going to delve in this morning to the new stories, new insights that we develop together here. Things that I come across I think may be interesting to start to spark conversation. Um, same as always, I tell you to be positive, think about somebody that you love, somebody that you admire, that you respect, you know, write something kind about them down in the comment section, forward this to them, tell them to go look for it, give them a, a spark in their day to see that you're thinking about them. And on a daily basis, we're going to do this for different people in our lives and we're going to encourage them to, to give the respect and encouragement to people that who has given it to them before. Um, Cause at the end of the day, we all need that. We all need, uh, we're social creatures. We're social animals. We love the connection from, um, from birth through, you know, entire existence, even to um, our passing from this plane. We, we are very social beings, you know, moving on or, Passing into the next to the next story. Let's go with uh, this Russian hypersonic technology expert accused of high treason. So before we start the story a little bit, let's talk slightly about hypersonic technology. This is a new avenue to develop weaponry that Russia and China jumped out to an advantage initially, probably be, I would say through the late aughts, which is the, the the double O's, the 2000s through um, the the 2010s. But now America, I think, is doing um, has done an admirable job of catching up with um, the Russian and Chinese development. And it may be due to uh, stories like this that we're coming across. This Russian, according to Moscow on Thursday, ordered a specialist in hypersonic technology. And, I, you know, I was meant to talk about that, and I may even make a separate video at some point um, discussing hypersonic technology separately. But in a nutshell, it's missiles that can travel greater than Mach 5, Mach 5 and Mach 6, and they some of them even go faster, Mach 9. I was even seeing uh, some ones that may reach the level of Mach 21. But these missiles, now intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles travel at hypersonic speeds, but they're very on a very predictable uh, trajectory that uh, we, the currently the United States, Russia, China, tries to de develop in other countries as well develop a uh, Israel Iron Dome for example is a, an example of a system that can look lock on ballistic missiles and track their trajectory and shoot a vehicle to um, target it and quote unquote uh, destroy it I said quote unquote because I don't know how the algorithm may hit me I'm just early in this and I'm trying to get the algorithm to be friendly initially the so a lot of the pauses stuff is because of, of how my language normally is uh, <laughs> with my friends, but I'm trying to uh, keep this PG for the moment, relatively. The But these missiles can travel in the atmosphere at those speeds and also move, maneuver. And so they're very difficult to shoot down with the ballistic, anti-ballistic missile systems that were developed uh, previously. So it takes a new generation of anti-ballistic uh, technology to to deal with these new hypersonic vehicles. But 
So a court in Moscow on Thursday ordered a specialist in hypersonic technologies to be kept in jail pending charges on trial, sorry, pending trial on charges of high treason in the latest in a series of espionage cases targeting Russian scientists. The Lee Fort Tovio district court ruled at a hearing behind closed doors that Alexander Karanov, director general and chief designer of the St. Petersburg based hypersonic systems research Institute should remain in pretrial detention for two months. Materials of the case are classified a uh, website of Karnavov Institute, of Karnavov's Institute states that he worked on the concept of the Ajax hypersonic vehicle, a project first proposed in the late 1980s by Soviet engineer Vladimir Freestad. Instead of protecting the vehicle flying at hypersonic speed from the heat it generates, Freestad suggested assimilating the heat to augment energy resources. Russia had prided itself on being the only country to commission hypersonic missiles traveling more than five times faster than the speed of sound Mach 5. Their development came as Moscow's relationship relations with the West hit post Cold War lows after Russia's 2014 annexation of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. The new weapons include the Avangard hypersonic glide vehicle, which Russian officials say is capable of flying 27 times faster than sound. Wow, Mach 27. And making sharp maneuvers on its way to target, on its way to target to dodge the defensive missile shield. Russian officials have charged that Western spy agencies have redoubled their efforts to obtain information on the country's new technologies. Over the past year, several scientists, including those involved in studies on hypersonic technologies, have been accused of passing classified information to foreign powers. Well, you know, it's always been the model of most countries um, and it makes sense to me that if you can't create it yourself then you either buy it or steal it and it's been done to us and not sure if it's china or united states who may be even both involved in that um acquisition or or it could be that at the end of the day you never know how any of these work out he could have upset um, the order in charge over there and they just decided this is a way of getting rid of that scientist. They may have found it, the new guy who knows how to make the, the weaponry even better. Leading into the next story, the Army's first laser weapon is almost ready for a fight. If you remember from a few days back, we discussed the Air Force were working in um, air tunnels to work out the the, 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 the the dynamics of how they were going to implement laser weaponry on their planes. Easier to do on the ground, as you can imagine. And the Army here has, slowly but surely, the Army is inching towards fielding its first true combat-capable high-powered laser weapon mounted on a striker infantry carrier vehicle. So they've had a a shoot off between Northrop Grumman and Raytheon, two companies that are traded. Oh, and you know, it goes without saying that none of this is ever financial advice, medical advice, uh, or anything else that you would consider advice. It's just discussions that we are all having together. But Northrop Grumman and Raytheon are two companies traded on private, I mean, publicly traded companies on stock exchange, in other words. So they had a shoot off and they're calling this a short range, short air defense, um, short range air defense system with DM short rad uh, and find that these 50 kilowatt laser weapons are seem like able to get the job done. So the shoot off saw two 50 kilowatt laser weapons developed in a competition between defense contractors Northrop Grumman and Raytheon participate in a series of vignettes designed to emulate realistic threats in combat scenarios, according to the service. Th those vignettes included simulated UAS, which are basically drones, unmanned aerial systems, 
uh, drones, rocket artillery, mortar, ram targets for the systems to engage. The laser-equipped strikers faced a number of realistic scenarios designed to establish for the first time in the Army the desired characteristics for future DM Shorad systems, the service said in a statement. And how it uh, ties into the previous story, this is the first combat application of lasers for a maneuver element in the Army, said Army Hypersonic and Directed Energy Chief Lieutenant General L. Neil Thurgood in a statement. The technology we have today is ready. This is a gateway to the future. So you see how hypersonics and directed energy as new weapon systems are being tied in together. So what do you use to take out? The hypersonic vehicles that can now evade the previous generation anti-ballistic systems, directed energy, which travel at either speed of light or near speed of light to be able to engage those vehicles. And that comes in another discussion. We'll talk about that, about the plasma the vehicles throw off conventional radar. Um, very, very fascinating new technologies that are being now fielded in our military, which of course will be coming to civilian life in some capacity in the future, just like a lot of how technology is. And that's why it's important to kind of get a sense of what's coming next to play a game of, of, of kind of on our, on our, in our own way, trying to be like the, the algorithms that can predict what's going to happen next. Humans are good at that as well. We're pretty good at um, pronostication. just talks about a little bit of the, the they first were initially thinking about and some of these things I don't know if I need to just completely read to you I kind of leave it so you can pause some if you want to go in and look for yourself um, but it just talks about how they were initially planning on using them and then, and this probably is a good part though the Pentagon once envisioned deploying laser equipped strikers downrange in Iraq and Syria to counter the flying IEDs so ISIS and other terror groups were basically packing explosives onto drones and then flying them towards our uh, friendly troops. But applications to the European theater became a, a major focus for military planners after the U.S. Army identified a major short-range air defense gap in the aftermath of Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea. And also, I imagine the battle um, uh, between, who was Armenia and... Um, um, I'm a, I don't want to butcher the name of that country, and I know how to say it, but I, I'm getting confused with another one right now. But th it, that's the future of warfare right now. Uh, even there's some ships, and I'm sure we'll get to those stories at some point, some ships um, at sea have been hit by uh, explosive-laden drones now. And I know Israel was accusing Iran of attacking some ships with explosive-laden uh, drones. Uh, Armenia fought. Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, I think Azerbaijan, and they were using a lot of drones um, in that battle. I think it was decisive. So having a system now, and it seems that the 50 kilowatt um, capacity lasers are good for drones and um, probably the, the shorter level. So imagine the next phase of uh, Iron Dome for Israel will probably be employing these laser weaponry. Priority working on it now. Interestingly enough, uh, the system isn't the only laser weapon the Army is working on at the moment. As task force previously reported, the service is also working to field a 300 kilowatt indirect fires protection uh, capability, high energy laser, truck mounted laser by 2024. These will be able to take out incoming cruise missiles. And who is profiting or who's investing in all of this and is making money off of it? These big institutions that the ones that we are able to invest in and make money off as well, because it's going to happen. So you might as well decide, you know, you can send in your principles and, and, and watch what happened and become angry and forming over years or decide how to. Um, use the system to gain your ability to be able to make a, um, an impact. 
And capital is what you need to be able to make an impact in this world. For years, and it, it's happening now, but for years, the big thing in crypto was about when will institutional money get involved? Will institutional money get involved? And the answer is yes. And because of that, it's all about game theory, and I was going to discuss that a little bit later, but I'll, I'll start off a little bit now to have it kind of peppering around in your brain. And game theory is basically, with, with, with Bitcoin specifically, game theory is a long, different story, and we'll do a separate video about that. But with Bitcoin was, okay, there's only a limited supply. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. And a lot of them have been lost already. The numbers are between like 4 and 6 million at the moment. There are probably about getting close to... 2.5, I have to look exactly, I'm not exactly sure at the moment, but about two and a half million Bitcoin to be mined, which will take another about 120 years or so to get to the rest of the Bitcoin. So that's it. And there'll never be any more. So the, and, and what game theory ties into that is basically once the big institutions get involved, Knowing that it's this finite supply, then it would become the ultimate deflationary game where there's only there's 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exist. And let's just say it's like 18.5 now, getting close to 19. There are 54, maybe a number, maybe even higher now. We had a great year last year financially, you know, not for a lot of other people, but, but, but individuals who had wealth and were gaining wealth, it was a great year, sad to say, or, you know, long story short, 54, 55 million millionaires. So if every millionaire said, I want to spend a million dollars to buy a Bitcoin, there are not enough Bitcoin for that. It becomes a bidding war amongst millionaires to get one Bitcoin. And there's entities with hundreds of thousands and tens of thousands of Bitcoin. So those, those in, in, in that, it, it becomes a game where the numbers for Bitcoin, and we'll talk about price speculation for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies at some point, becomes in the tens of millions of dollars. Institutional money is pouring into the crypto market and it's only going to grow. In the formula of years, Bitcoin was di dismissed by institutions as a showy, worthless digital asset favored by criminals. Gradually, the tectonic plates that shaped sentiment in the corridors of power shifted. Bitcoin, which appeared to be on an ideological collision course with institutions in its first decade of existence, recently bears the hallmark of institutional acceptance. These are good times. Smart money. This has been driven by a number of factors led by the outstanding performance of Bitcoin relative to any other asset class on the planet. Smart money is allocating to Bitcoin as a portfolio diversification strategy. These days, family offices, hedge funds and traditional money managers have a very different perspective on cryptocurrency products and services with an eye water and 17 billion worth of institutional capital flooding into, into the space this year alone. And it's only going to grow. And it's probably way more than that. Um, periodic surveys bear that a growing number of institutional investors allocating a percentage of their portfolios to digital assets. A recent study conducted by Fidelity Digital Assets found that seven in 10 institutional investors expect to buy or invest in crypto assets in the near future. More than half of the 1,100 respondents surveyed between December and April revealed that they already own such investments. BlackRock, which is a huge company, adds crypto to its balance sheet. Financial advisors and high net worth individuals, individuals naturally prick up their ears. BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager with $9.5 trillion assets under management, is one of 16. They also have been buying up a bunch of real estate as well. And that's a discussion that we'll come to at another point. 
is one of 16 mutual fund managers, including Morgan Stanley Investment Management, to gain exposure to the crypto market via its Global Allocation and Strategic Income Opportunities Funds, which have a collective worth of over $40 billion. BlackRock is also indirectly exposed to Bitcoin via a 14.56% stake in MicroStrategy. And MicroStrategy, for those who in the know, is you know, is the company that's leading the way in terms of a public company that has used its balance sheet to use its use its balance sheet to facilitate the kind of mainstreaming of cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin. They bought a bunch of Bitcoin at, and holding it as they take a debt. They have issued a stock for it, turned all their cash into it. They hold, and that's one of the companies that hold over a hundred and some thousand, like 105,000 Bitcoin on their balance sheet as a uh, publicly traded company. Oh, well, she said this year, sorry. The cloud software firm with over $3.4 billion of BTC on its balance sheet. MicroStrategy's outspoken founder, Michael Saylor, has been one of Bitcoin's biggest champions in recent years, arguing that it will soon be on the balance sheet of cities, states, and governments. Companies, small and big investors, as well as core to tech innovation at Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. It's core to tech innovation. There's more just talking about other um, unicorn um, privately owned startups that reached more than a greater billion dollar valuation like Coinbase, Bitpanda. Talks about in recent years, a range of options become available to those who are interested in cryptos, including Grayscale, Bitcoin Trust. This would allow investors to speculate on Bitcoin without needing to buy it directly. Also, uh, Grayscale has other trusts for Filecoin, Basic Attention Token, Chainlink, Ethereum, Cardano. And this was interesting. Equity type investments are currently setting, currently setting records. This year, 10 of the 12 largest financing rounds in crypto were completed, raising just under $3.9 billion. One startup, the derivatives exchange FTX, managed to raise $900 million to achieve a cool valuation of $18 billion. And a lot of it is just speculation, but understanding that these companies and institutions and individuals there, this is their job to understand what's coming next, to, to factor in what's going to be important for their company. And they understand that a lot of it is going to be crypto. Now, here, um, Scott Melkler, who is the uh, a trader and host of the Wolf of All Streets, believes that when there becomes an approval of an ETF, and there are a lot of, I think, over 18 now institutions that have applied for ETFs in America, that this will be what would be push us to more than 100 into the six figure prices, that then a lot of the individuals who were afraid of getting into the market. Here, I'll read it here. The approval of an ETF would be the single biggest event in the history of Bitcoin for that large wall of money to have the confidence to enter pension funds, endowments, sovereign wealth funds. They will come in when there is an ETF in America, quote unquote, United States. And it's a lot to think, in, in, you know, I talked about a little bit before um, that, you know, because of the game theory and the fact that when, the, when these different entities started start to compete against one another, we don't know where the end price will be, but it's going to be huge. And when it does, you can be imagined, you can more than imagine that the scammers will be there. Now, this is an interesting scam and it's a lot of different scams. And we'll probably do a separate video talking about different scams out there. But the one 
this was, you know, a story that came up. This was, I haven't heard of this one before. Um, and I'll tell you about one that, you know, is pretty, pretty common. You can, if you are on social media, you still see to this day. And this one both involved kind of QR codes. This one, they said that under this new scam, the threat actors provide the victim with a QR code and direct them to a Bitcoin ATM to make the payment. Notably, this scam depends on the victim panicking and following their directions to make a payment. In one case, the perpetrator pretended to be from an electricity company. They threatened the victim they will shut off their electricity or other utility services if payment is not immediately remitted. Of course, do not always, if anybody says I'm going to cut something off or this is a threat, do not respond to that piece of paper or that email directly. Do not click anything on that link. Don't call any number on there. Go to a third source, which is, you know, if you have an old bill from that company or you go Google the, the number to call for that company and call that that a different number that you or if it's the same number that comes up on their official site or you got from there, then yeah, you may feel uh, safer in that way. But the most important thing is do not respond directly to any. We are going to, you know, a threat of we're going to do this to you right now. Call yourself and try to talk to, you know, is the official site. And then that way you find out if it's real or not. Another uh, big one using the QR code is where they'll have on Twitter. I'm not on a bunch of social media, so you have to uh, there may be other ones, but I know I've heard of Twitter and YouTube where they'll say, you know, send us this amount of cryptocurrency and we'll double it or, you know, and they'll use the name of somebody famous like uh, that into cryptocurrency you hear about like Elon Musk or Mark Cuban, or Kathy Woods, anything like that, Cardano, they'll, they'll say these names and say, send us this money and we'll double it. That's always going to be a scam. Never, ever trust that. There's no easy money in this, you know. The, the, what it seems like easy to others is that it, it, it's going to take um, hard work and patience. So find a, a, a project, which is a coin that you believe in, and just start dollar cost, and we'll talk about this at some point in another video, dollar cost averaging into it over a period of time, and that's the best way to get the gains that, you know, you can be happy with. And what can you be happy with? This is where we're going to kind of end today at, is talk about what, what do you need to be comfortable to retire at? Here, they said that workers think they need half a million dollars, $500,000 to retire comfortably. Are they right? And that's for Gen X. That said, while Gen Xers and Gen Zers think they'll be set with $500,000, baby boomers think they'll need a median of $750,000 for a comfortable retirement. And millennials, oh my gosh, my, my millennials are beating down. I gotta, we, gotta, we have to work together to build them back up, everyone. We're going to depend on them. Are confident that they'll get by with a median $300,000. Now, at the end, one of the and this things we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. But one of the things, the calculations they give you is saying, take what you make in the last year of whatever it is you're working. So your last year of work, you're making fifty thousand dollars. Multiply that times 10 to 12 here. Another good bet is to think about what your ending salary may look like and aim to have roughly 10 to 12 times that some socked away before your career comes to a close. If you're in your 50s earning 50,000 a year, that $50,000, I'm sorry, 500,000 saving estimate may be reasonably spot on for you. Whereas if you're in your 40s earning $100,000 already, it may probably it probably won't. So, this is kind of a think about how much you think you'll be making by the end of your career and multiply that by 10 to 10 or 12. A way I tend to think of it is is you're going to think about you got to think about how much is going to be your the amount of money you're going to need. And you don't want to kind of time it up to be at the exact end. We're going to be living longer, which we'll be discussing in another, in another video as well. Longevity. But we're going to be living longer. So when you want to retire, 
guesstimate how much life you may have. So say if you want to retire at 60, let's just pick some round numbers for now. And you may live to be 100 or 110 now, just the way technology is going. So 40 to 50 years. Let's just err on the side of caution and say 50 years. So if I retire at 60, I'm going to live for another 50 years. How much money would I want to live comfortably with? That's the, that's going to be so how much per month you think after you paying bills. So hopefully by then you've been able to pay off a place to live at uh, most of the things you may have other expenses that come in. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But so guesstimate how much, you know, at the end of the month, if I have this amount of money, I made it. I made a good amount. And that could be somewhere from I need two thousand a month to I need ten thousand a month, whatever it may be. So say if it's two thousand a month. Um, then each year you're going to need at least $24,000 for 50 years, which would be get you to about $1.2 million. Check my math. I may be a little wrong with that. I'm doing it really quickly on the fly right now. But the if you're making $10,000, if you say I want $10,000 um, a month, then you want, you're going to need uh, $120,000 per year for the next 50 years, which is 70, 7 million, 7 million. Yeah. I think check my mouth on that as well. Um, so this kind of give you, for me, gives you a sense of how much you're going to really, really need to uh, be thinking about to retire comfortably. And that's, you know, and, and these are the things you need to be thinking about. You said and putting money in social security is, how's that going to contribute to it? What are you setting aside and, and are you planning for health care? Because as you get older, you may have health care expenses. Hopefully we are able to mitigate some of that with that technology that's going to allow us to live longer. Where you want to live, the cost of living. And those are the things and, and the other costs that come up as well be if you're going to have if your children are going, you know, you're 60. But how old are your children? Are they going to be in college, out of college, going to grandchildren you want to help with these things that are going to may Add on to how much you think you want to spend. And one of the first videos I'm going to kind of do separate from these daily uh, where we look at news articles and just kind of talk about it will be long term planning and starting that process, because the earlier you do it, the better you'll be is, is not as hard as you think it is. And this is someone who learned later in life themselves, but learned the lessons pretty well, I feel. Um, and so I wish I, you know, I, I would love to have, go back and tell my younger self this. And so for younger, anybody who I can talk to, I, I push them to think about these things um, now and to start the process. Just little, little steps, baby steps um, can lead you to being able to leap to the moon. So not going to keep you much longer. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. I love doing this. I love the, the, the thought of someday interacting more, but. Um, for now, it's just wonderful to know that, um, you know, some people are getting some enjoyment out of this. That makes me feel good. Know that I love you. Love yourself. God loves you. And that's all that matters.